Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Maggie and I was a former professional MCAT tutor, now a medical student, and I am here on this channel with my brother John to take you guys through the AAMC free practice exam. Today we're going to be going over the third CARS passage, so buckle in. If you're not familiar with the way that we go through CARS passages, we have three videos that kind of take you through um, how to condense a CARS passage down to a main idea, which is what is really useful when you're answering any questions about a passage. So definitely go give those a watch if you haven't seen them. Otherwise, I'm just going to read through this passage and kind of stop when I get to the end of an idea and kind of summarize what I've read thus far, which is how I actually tackle them when I'm like actually taking them during a test. So I like to go down and see the uh, title first. It says, Long Live the Industrial City. It starts out, it has become fashionable partly due to the work of urban studies theorist Richard Florida to think of cities as big idea labs. While this theory is not incorrect, it is incomplete. Okay, so end of an idea here. The author gives us this idea, cities are big idea labs, and then says that it's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. So I'm guessing that they're going to fill out what they think about it. Cities are indeed filled with the modern day equivalent of the Luftmenschen. The term translates from Yiddish as people who lived on air. Hmm. In many sectors of the creative industry, however, there comes a point when something tangible must be produced, and when, because of financial or time constraints, it makes sense to have it produced locally. So uh, I, f I always pay attention to like quotations, because usually authors will put things in quotations to kind of mean that they are um, sarcastic, or that they don't truly like believe that it's like this, but it is constantly termed like this. Like maybe the author doesn't believe maybe doesn't believe like in the merit maybe of the creative industry. I'm not really sure, but I expect that idea to be more fleshed out as we keep going. So we did uh, come to a new idea here and it, they're talking about uh, production and actual um, tangible things that come from ideas and how it makes sense for those things to be produced locally. Now it says, locating manufacturing close to the site of creation is not simply a matter of convenience. The process of production can inform and shape the pr creative process it itself. So it sounds like the author maybe, maybe is not a fan of cities because um, it's so hard for things to get produced locally or something. Um, and sounds like the author is a fan of the production and the ideas kind of being geographically close to one another. Even as New York was gaining in stature as a fashion capital in the latter half of the 20th century, however, its share of the U.S. garment production declined from a commanding 90% to less than 10%. So there is some like actual evidence there. You know when the questions later on will ask about like what's the evidence in the passage? So that's evidence right there that um, cities don't produce their own stuff. Roger Cohen, a second generation owner of Regal Originals, identifies himself as the only unionized pleader left in the city. In the 1980s, there were 400 of them. So there we go, more evidence. So this is a fully fleshed out idea. Although this development resulted from a complex mixture of forces, suffice it to say that advances in communication and transportation diminished New York City's inherent geographic advantage in manufacturing. So let's sum up kind of the first two paragraphs. The author's saying that it's a, kind of a prevailing idea to think of cities as big idea labs, but that is incomplete. Um, that they are filled with um, people who live on air, but it's better to have the production kind of geographically close. And that is not the case anymore. That there has been a sharp decline in the amount of like production that takes place in these uh urban centers. The question then is not so much why the garment industry in New York has shrunk, but rather why there continues to be a garment district at all. In asking this question, we might as well be asking why cities continue to exist. So that's a, a big statement right there. If we postulate only the usual economic forces, observed economist Robert Lucas, cities should fly apart. Why would young designers live in New York when they could live more comfortably in other cities with much lower cost of living? The answer is that people come to be near other people, to draw upon their expertise, to exchange ideas, to compete. 
Firms locate near one another to gain a sense of what the competition is doing, to hire talent, and to benefit from the kind of concentrated presence that offers one-stop shopping to out-of-town buyers. So I, I do like what the author's done here because they kind of ask this question, why do cities even continue to exist? Um, and then also answered it right after. So we don't have to like think about what that answer could be. Um, they said that the answer is that people come to be near other people. So other people and their expertise, their exchanging of ideas and their competition is the main driver of why cities still exist. So that seems like it may be like a big thing in this passage. So the reason why a city like New York still thrives, even after losing most of its industrial base, argues Richard Florida, is that economic success no longer revolves around simply making and moving things. Instead, he writes, it depends on generating and transporting ideas. Just as neuroscientists speculate that higher intelligence correlates with the number of network connections between neurons in the brain and the speed with which they communicate, the cities that function best are those with the highest velocity of ideas and the most efficient and robust links between people. The service suppliers of the garment district act as an informal incubator. That word may conjure gleaming office parks more than it does old buildings with questionable elevators, but the end result is the same. The loss of even a single fabric supplier like a ripple in a pond is felt everywhere. So this paragraph seems to be saying that um, the entire industry is like an interwoven net of supply and ideas and designers and that cities um, like New York just have like a high velocity of all all this is going on there's a whole bunch of people concentrated in one area and it just makes all those interwoven parts just that much stronger and faster more efficient so let's take a second to think about what the first four paragraphs are saying cities are big idea labs but they don't have the manufacturing presence that they used to have. It's kind of what this paragraph was saying. That is due to advances in communication and transportation. So now we can pick up a phone and call our supply person. But that the industry still thrives because people want to be near other people um, for like these reasons right here. Firms want to be near each other for these reasons right here. And that these cities are just a highly efficient interwoven network of expertise. Moving on, creativity and fashion, as in any art, can originate anywhere from a splash of color on a billboard to a new stitch. It is not surprising that cities tend to be hubs of creativity. There are more things and people to be inspired by, more knowledge transfer, and importantly, more ways to make creative ideas into reality. Urban planners should not necessarily try to preserve a specific industry, but to enable the seed beds that help create and sustain an empire of images and aura such as New York City's fashion industry. So it didn't add a whole lot, but they um, did add an interesting part here about like what urban planners should do because they haven't really brought up, like this wasn't about urban planning at all. So that was an interesting little tidbit that they threw in at the end. Okay, now I'm going to take what I've read. Uh, depending on where you are in your studies, you should be doing this in different ways. So if you're first starting out, you should be trying to get an immature main idea, the big arguments of the passage, the tone of the passage, and the author's intentions. If you're a little bit further along, you should be doing the house method. Again, these are all like um, in our condensed to the main idea videos that I highly recommend you watch if you're struggling with cars like I was. If you're um, into the house method, then you should be looking at um, incorporating your tone and author's intentions into your main idea and having like your biggest argument. But I'm going to kind of skip to the end and just get to a main idea that encompasses all of that. And I do like to flesh out my idea, take about 30 seconds at the end of the passage, uh, think about it and write it down because I'm going to probably refer back to it. So what I kind of came up with is cities have lost their manufacturing presence because of increased communication and transportation, but remain idea hubs because people mesh and compete. So you can see how I've got like my biggest arguments. They've lost their manufacturing presence. That was hugely um, like fleshed out in the second paragraph because of increased communication and transportation. That was like, again, the second paragraph. They remain idea hubs. You see how my little transition word um, that's going to encapsulate a lot of differing opinions throughout the passage. They remain idea hubs because people mesh and compete. 
which is kind of what this third paragraph was talking about. And the other stuff, I do want to remember small details and where they are, like the urban planners thing and stuff like that, but I'm, they're not large enough ideas for me to put them in my main idea. Okay, moving straight into the questions. This is number 15. Based on the passage, which statement is most likely to be true of a love mention? So since it did mention like such a specific word that I don't exactly remember, um, I'm going to go back up and read what it said about it. So it says... Um, cities are filled with the modern day equivalent of the love mention. The term translates from Yiddish as people who lived on air. So what I want you to do and what I, or what I highly recommend that you do is that you think about what you want the answer to the question to be before you look at any of the answer choices. I promise this was like a game changer for me. So this question is asking, what does this love mention word mean? People who lived on air. So obviously that's not literal. So what do we think that the author is saying by putting that in there? To me, it seems like um, people kind of with their head in the clouds, you know, the dreamers, um, the people who are going to be active in these big idea hubs. That seems like what he's talking about. So I'm going to put head in the clouds, dreamers. So let's see if any of the answer choices match what I want the answer choice to be. A, they tend to value innovation, but do not necessarily have innovative ideas. Definitely not, right? Like I, the author said that cities were full of these people. And I think the author would say that the city is full of people with innovative ideas. So I don't think A is right. B, they're more likely to be interested in the present than in the future. Um, I don't have any evidence to say that they would be interested in the present or the future more. You know, honestly, I would think if I had to guess, I would say they'd be more interested in the future because they're the dreamers, right? They're always thinking about what comes next. C, they're less likely or they are likely to be less pragmatic than theoretical. So I definitely think that that is true. If this is what that love mention means, then they would have like theoretical mindsets. Um, someone who would be grounded, who would be the opposite of this, who would be the realist, that would be the pragmatic people. So I definitely like C. D, they are rarely found outside of urban environment. I guess this is probably the next best one, but I think that that's a logical leap to say that they would be rarely found in outside of urban environment. It says cities are filled with these people, but it doesn't say that other places are not. And so that's kind of a fallacy right there. So I think C is going to be our best answer. Question 16 says, why does the author most likely mention Richard Florida in the first paragraph? So again, they mentioned right where it is. And I want to, I want to make sure who I knew who Richard Florida is. So to me, it sounds like the author is basically just laying out this framework pretty much just so they can say, that's an all right idea, but not perfect. And then add their own opinion. So A says he was a fashionable urban studies theorist. So the, the passage talked a lot about fashion and the fashion industry in New York, um, but never mentioned Richard Florida as a fashionable man. So it's all right. I mean, maybe they're saying fashionable as in popular urban studies theorist. But uh, I don't know. I'll put a maybe by it. I want a better answer, though, because fashionable to me, like that feels like they're just trying to bait me because they talked about fashion so much in the passage. B, he popularized a particular theory about cities. So he definitely did, right? Popularized the idea of them as big idea labs. So I definitely like B, um, and I think I like it better than A. I'm going to read all the answer choices first, though. See, he exposed the limitations of a theory about ideas. He's the one who had the theory about ideas, right? He didn't expose the limitations. D, he made the term bluff mention relevant to urban studies. So that, that term was something that the author brought up. That was not something that Richard Florida said. So between A and B, to me, like, if you're going to say that they are saying the word fashionable as in, like, popular, like he was a popular urban studies theorist, I have less evidence to say that he was a popular urban studies theorist and more to say that he just popularized a particular theory. Like the theory was popular, not necessarily him. And also, I think that they're actually literally trying to say that he like was stylish. So I don't really like A. All right. Uh, question 17 says, why does the author mention Roger Cohen in paragraph two? Dang, so we're going back to the passage a lot. I don't normally go back to the passage that much, but if they say something in specific or like a specific paragraph, then I usually do. I just make sure not to waste more than 10 seconds with going back. So paragraph two, uh, Roger Cohen, second generation owner. Um, he's the only unionized pleader left in the city. 
So again, that was when I was talking about like evidence, 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 like that is a lot of evidence that um, manufacturing has dropped a lot in big cities. So I think that the author mentions Roger Cohen pretty much as that evidence as proof. A, to demonstrate the New York garment in district was characterized by family-owned businesses. So no, we did not get the vibe that that was family-owned. And also, like, that doesn't have anything to do with the main idea. B, to suggest that unionization influenced the fate of the New York garment district. So didn't talk about unionization, right? C, to indicate that the New York garment district was not limited to fashion design and fabric manufacture. Isn't pleater, aren't pleaters? Would that not be fabric manufacturer? I don't know, but that's not really why. D, to give evidence of the constriction of the New York Garment District over time. So perfect, right? Evidence um, of that manufacturing going down. Question 18 says, based on the passage, which factors was, were likely to have influenced the size of the New York Garment District? So again, what do we want the answer to be? Why did the Garment District drop so much? Go look back at our main idea. Increased communication and transportation. Number one says great and unanticipated increases in manufacturing by competitor countries bumped the United States out of the lead. So we didn't talk about other countries, right? Two says email and inexpensive long distance phone calls made it less necessary to be in close physical proximity to others in the industry, right? That's communication. Three flights to and from the United States increased in frequency and speed while simultaneously decreasing in price. Now this feels a little bit off, but that is technically transportation. And it was just so clearly put that um, transportation was an important factor in that. So your answer here is going to be D. Now I know y'all may be like, well, how did you know to put that in your main idea? And it's because the idea of, of the communication and transportation was not very big. That was only in one sentence right here. But the idea of the manufacturing being dropped or that that industry diminishing over time was so important. Look how much evidence they put in there. If they, this is a tiny little passage, if they are putting more than two sentences um, to prove something or to explain it more, that's a very important idea. So I wanted to have like a because reason. And so um, you can see it right there. Advances in communications and transportation, not anything to do with other countries. Ergo, that would be two and three. 19 says, which element does the author use to present Florida's position in paragraph four? So again, we're going back in paragraph four. That is this one. So what is Florida's position is, is the first thing. Okay, that New York still thrives even after losing its industrial base because economic success no longer revolves around simply making and moving. It depends on generating and transporting ideas. Just as neuroscientists speculate, higher intelligence correlates with the number of network connections, the stuff about neuroscientists. So that's probably the element that they're talking about. And what element is it when we say something and then we give a similar situation to a completely different circumstance? That'd probably be an analogy, right? Would it be, did, did the author present a counter argument? That would be they give an argument and then they give the counter argument. They give um, the opposite argument and then they follow up their original argument with another kind of argument. I didn't really see that. It was more of an analogy. It was more of like a, just as neuroscientists talk about how the synapses, blah, 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 blah. That is not a counter argument. That's more of an analogy. See an example. So it wasn't really an example, right? Because they completely took it to a different scenario. They started talking about the brain and how it's similar to cities. So that's not directly an example. And D, a paradox. So a paradox is something that is seemingly um, counterintuitive or like doesn't make sense together, but there happens to be a little bit of truth in it. And unfortunately, you do have to kind of like know these little English literature words. They're not very common question types, but they do come up. So I would just recommend that you go look up some. But in this case... Um, you should probably be familiar with what an analogy is, and that is what was presented in the passage. All right, number 20 says, which phenomenon does the passage not explain? So this this is probably going to be like 
the main idea of the passage is this, and we're going to show you a bunch of different scenarios that have nothing to do with the passage because look at like glance at the answer choices. They have nothing to do with the passage, but it's not the passage that we care about. It's the main idea and it's the, um, the inspiration behind the main idea that we care about. Okay. So here's my main idea. I just wanted to have it there. So a says the successful reclusive writer. So what was the main inspiration behind this passage? Writing is a creative industry, and if they are successful, you would think that that would be because of the influence of other people and of competition between other people. So it would be a little bit um, against this passage to say that a reclusive writer could be successful. So that's a maybe there, because we're looking for one that does is not explained by the passage. B, the popularity of academic conferences. So what is at academic conferences? It's a bunch of creative minds or academic minds or whatever meshing together people chatter and chit chatting so that would be explained by the passage right because that's what people like to do they like to mesh so that's probably not the right answer uh summer programs for musicians same thing musicians be meshing their creative minds together um that's something that they like to do and that's uh, as evidenced by the passage D, small towns where artists tend to live. So this one's interesting because small towns, that's the opposite of what the passage was talking about, right? And artist, it kind of talked, it kind of talked like that creative minds want to live in, in urban places. So that is um, kind of counterintuitive to the passage. So to me, I have a 50, 50. So why do people want to live in big cities it's because they want to be around other people so it's not necessarily the big cities it's the people so we are given evidence in a by them telling us that this writer is reclusive they're not interacting with other people whereas the artist yeah they live in a small town and there probably is less people around but they're still people and what if it's a small town that's full of hundreds of artists for some reason. I don't know. But to split hairs between two answer choices like this, you have to think like this. Like you have to think about like, there is a clearly right answer and I need to get to the bottom of why it's clearly right. And this is because the whole passage was talking about people meshing with people and creative minds meshing with creative minds. And so to say that a, a, a reclusive writer could be successful would not be in line with the passage. All right. Um, the last question, number 21 says, based on the passage, what does Robert Lucas most likely mean by the usual economic forces in passage or in paragraph three? Um, I do see usual economic forces is right there, but I'm going to read like the beginning of the sentence. In asking the question, we might as well be asking why cities continue to exist. If we postulate only the usual economic forces, cities should fly apart. Why would young designers live in New York when they can live more comfortable in other cities with lower cost of living? So the question is, what did he mean by the usual economic forces? I would recommend that you read one sentence above and one sentence below whatever is mentioned in the question. If they like kind of mention um, in quotations something from the passage like this, because you're going to get context. So the usual economic forces is probably what is fleshed out in the sentence right after it, that living, um, there's lower cost of living in other places. That's a usual economic force that drives people out of the city. And then the author goes on to answer kind of why they, they think that they see people still staying in cities. But anyway, what does the person mean by usual economic forces? Is it A, the tendency of businesses to locate near their competitors? No, that was not talked about in that paragraph, right? B, the tendency to consider expense as a primary driver of choice, right? I like that because the expense of living is a primary driver of where you live. That's kind of like the usual economic forces that they were talking about. Um, C says the factors that lead cost of living to be high in many urban areas. Um, so this could be an attractive answer choice if you kind of like didn't read the next sentence down and uh, just looked at the usual economic forces and you know we're talking about urban areas. Um, so this could be attractive, but but you notice that 
that usual economic forces sentence being followed up immediately by talking about the cost of living driving people out of the city, that's probably what they're talking about then. Um, so definitely read like before and after. Uh, D, the preference people show for the newest and most valuable items. No, right? Because we're looking for... B is just a great answer choice, and it's kind of hard to mark it out when you read that next sentence. All right, so that's the end of that passage. I hope that breakdown was helpful. If you liked anything in this video, please hit like and subscribe to our channel so that we can keep making videos like this. And comment down below what you want to see next if you hated this video. Also make sure to look in the description below. We have a ton of new projects going on all the time. And so just uh, check out the links in the description. I'll see you on the next one.